Hello friends, a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to our viewers who have joined from different parts of the world today. As you all know, in the wake of the ongoing coronavirus disease pandemic, the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights, or what we call APCR SHR 10, has evolved from an in-person conference to an ongoing virtual series under the name of APCR SHR 10 Virtual, co-hosted by APCR SHR 10, Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia, and CNS, this virtual conference features 14 thematic online sessions spread over June to December 2020, with plenary speakers and top-ranking abstract presenters sharing their insights around sexual and reproductive health and rights and SDGs in the Asia-Pacific regional context. Today, we present the third session of these online sessions, which, as always, is also being streamlined live on the Facebook page of APCR SHR 10 and CNS. Today's session focuses on sexual and reproductive health and rights in the Pacific. I now hand over the mic to our chairperson, Matalita Seva Kadravula. She's executive director of Reproductive and Family Health Association of Fiji and has over 20 years experience in sexual and reproductive health and rights work and has worked across the South Pacific in sexual and reproductive health information and education. Bula Ma, and over to you now. Bula, greetings, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. My name is Matelita Seba Dandrabula, the Executive Director of the Reproductive and Family Health Association of Fiji, a member of the International Planned Parenthood Federation. At the Reproductive and Family Health Association of Fiji, we aim to reach and empower the poorest, marginalized, socially excluded, and underserved population to make informed choices about their sexual and reproductive health. We are committed to changing attitudes towards sexual and reproductive health and rights in Fiji through our extensive community engagement and advocacy at the national and provincial, provincial level. The Reproductive and Family Health Association of Fiji is committed to working with and for young people in ensuring access to sexual and reproductive health and rights information and services. The Pacific region is extraordinarily diverse. 22 countries are spread across thousands of islands scattered over an area equivalent to 15% of the globe's surface. National populations range from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands and to over 8 million in Papua New Guinea. Amongst this small global population, 25% of the world's languages are spoken and there is significant diversity across Melanesian, Polynesian and Micronesian cultures, as well as between the scales of economies in the region. The Pacific has the highest level of unmet need for contraception in the world. One in four women in the Pacific wants to use modern contraception but is currently unable to do so, exceeding the average unmet need for the entire continent of Africa. The contraceptive prevalence rates that have not only been stagnant for a decade, but in some countries are alarmingly beginning to decline. There is mixed progress toward reducing adolescent birth rates and total fertility rates, whilst maternal mortality is still unacceptably high in many Pacific countries. In Fiji and PNG, Papua New Guinea, there is increasingly prevalence of cervical cancer and related mortality and other reproductive cancers amounting to three times higher than the global average. Epidemic levels of physical and sexual gender-based violence with up to 80% of women in Pacific Island countries reporting having experienced gender-based violence. There is growing incidence of STIs in several Pacific Island countries with young people particularly at risk. People with a disability, particularly women, are underserved by sexual and reproductive health rights information and services are, oft are often survivors of rights violations. The LGBTIQ community continues to face stigma and discrimination when seeking out sexual and reproductive health rights information and services in several 
Pacific County context. There is a widespread myths and misconceptions about SRHR issues across the region, with young people particularly stigmatized when seeking access to services. Across all Pacific Island countries, political support for the integration of comprehensive sexuality education and other forms of sexual and reproductive health and rights education into school curriculums is also a continued challenge. The region is among the most disaster prone in the world, exposed to a wide variety of increasingly frequent natural disasters exacerbated by climate change, including cyclones, droughts, earthquakes, storm surges, tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions. During crisis, women, girls, and marginalized groups are disproportionately disadvantaged and at heightened risk of sexually transmitted infections, HIV infection, unintended pregnancy, maternal death and illness, and sexual gender-based violence. In today's sessions, we will be talking about access to male family planning methods in Timor-Leste, to adolescent sexual and reproductive well-being in the Republic of Fiji, and then we'll go to rural Vanuatu and talk about sexual and reproductive health rights, knowledge, access, and barriers, and a roadmap to achieving zero unmet need in the Pacific. But before we go into all these discussions, let's hear from Karen Hill, the Director of Programs and Operations Specific at International Plan. Karen has over 25 years experience in international development and humanitarian response, and has worked across Australia, Asia, Africa, and the Pacific in senior leadership roles. Karen's sectoral experience includes sexual and reproductive health and rights, public health, rural and community development, food security, water, sanitation and hygiene, education, gender equality, disability, law and justice, governance, child rights, and humanitarian assistance. She will be speaking on sexual and reproductive health rights in the Pacific, a strategic approach. Karen. Hey, thank you very much, Ma. <laughs> it's lovely to see you. Uh, Bula Vinaka, everyone, and a very warm welcome from beautiful Fiji. Thank you very much for your time today. I feel privileged to be online with so many great colleagues. And I'm very excited to present today on how the International Planned Parenthood Federation, IPPF, has taken a strategic approach to improving sexual and reproductive health and rights in the Pacific. So IPPF has been operational in the Pacific for over 30 years. And although the history of the, each of the nine member associations is different, their clear focus and mandate is improving sexual and reproductive health and rights, or SRHR. IPPF member associations are local autonomous organisations with their own board and governance mechanisms. Each member association must go through a rigorous accreditation process every four years. Sorry. To ensure that they meet the highest quality standards. IPPF has a fully accredited member association in um, each of eight countries. So Cook Islands, Fiji, Kiribati, Samoa, Solomon Islands, Tonga, Tuvalu, and Vanuatu. And we also have our collaborating partner in Papua New Guinea that's in the process of moving to associate member on its path to full accreditation. The Pacific region sits under the IPPF East and Southeast Asia and Oceania region, ECOR, but the sub-regional office for the Pacific, uh, affectionately known as SROP, is based here in Fiji. And IPPF work with a range of regional and national partners, including UNFPA, Pacific Disability Forum, Pacific Women, UN Women, as well as civil society organizations and national government ministries, including health, women's affairs and youth, among others. And our key donors to date are the Australian Government, the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs, or DFAT, and the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, MFAT. In, in 2018, 
IPPF decided that we needed a clear vision and mission for SRHR in the Pacific. And whilst we'd been doing okay, we, the data showed that we needed to do better, much, much better. And as Matalita completely outlined very well in the beginning, and I won't repeat, the Pacific has some of the poorest health and social indicators in the world. So we decided that we should develop the new VACA Pacific strategy. Why the name new VACA? Well, new or coconut is often referred to as the tree of life. It floats between Pacific islands and puts down roots where it lands. Vaka or canoe was you, were used by ancient Pacific Islanders to link islands together and symbolizes our shared history and identity. Hence, new Vaka embodies the ideals of sustainability, resourcefulness, resilience, and connectedness. So the strategy runs over the period 2019 to 2022 and completely aligns with the IPPF global strategy. Our vision is that the people in the Pacific are free to make choices about their sexuality and well-being without discrimination. And our mission is to lead a locally owned, regionally relevant, globally connected movement in partnership, of course, that provides and enables services and champions SRHR for Pacific people, especially the underserved. The program has four overall outcomes. Firstly, that nine Pacific Island governments increasingly promote, respect, protect, and fulfill commitments to SRHR and gender equality. Secondly, that one million people in the Pacific are able to act freely on their SRHR. Thirdly, 1.2 million quality, integrated, gender and rights-based SRH services are delivered with a particular fo focus on reaching the underserved. And lastly, one single high-performing, accountable and united federation that drives sustainable positive change in the Pacific. We have five guiding principles. We aim to leave no one behind. We apply local solutions guided by evidence we work in partnership with others, we embed diversity in our work, and we are accountable to donors, partners, and of course, the people that we serve. Enabling people to make free and informed choices about their sexual reproductive health and rights, sexuality and well-being is key to improving the health and well-being of individuals and families, and a significant driver of economic and social development. So the strategy aims to provide targeted support to Pacific MAs, improve sustainability, develop institutional capacity, expand reach, especially to the marginalised and underserved, and build an enabling environment, and streamline organisational reporting and funding processes. So what's different about the strategy? In the past, much of our work was project-based and did not allow for the flexibility needed to respond effectively to emerging issues, nor allow member associations to develop holistic implementation strategies to address SRH needs in their national contexts. Rather than being an activity-based plan, the strategy focuses on our vision of what we're trying to achieve and outlines clear indicators and targets for determining success. We now develop integrated annual work plans that bring all of the different funding streams together to promote an integrated approach to all activities, to minimise duplication and gaps, and to ensure that all staff understand their roles and responsibilities and work seamlessly together. The strategy also provides an improved platform for donor engagement as we're able to clearly demonstrate and quantify our achievements. A critical factor was the implementation of a new monitoring and evaluation system across the Pacific at the end of 2017. At the moment, this is paper-based, but plans are underway to implement an electronic-based system in the near future, allowing for real-time data use for decision-making 
a huge innovation for the Pacific. And the strategy also allows single streamlined reporting on overall member association activities annually and provides continuous support for member association capacity building and technical advice. In addition, the strategy provides a roadmap for working across the development humanitarian continuing, continuum, enabling IPPF to build on experiences to improve and enhance overall service delivery. For example, humanitarian response often serves to highlight new areas of need. We also need to be able to deliver services such as sexual and gender-based violence in stable times as to enable us to do so effectively in a humanitarian crisis. And the strategy allows us to harness this learning. But probably the biggest difference in the pooled funding is the pooled funding approach. In project funding, which we've always implemented in the past, a project is designed ahead of time and often is quite rigid in its requirements. Activities are specified that might sound good and seem appropriate in the planning phase, but when we get to implementation, reality hits. Often blanket approaches are included in the design when nuanced national and local approaches are likely to have much more impact. The inherent flexibility in Newbacker funding, both core and restricted donor funds, is vital because MAs can determine their own priorities. It ensures guaranteed funding delivered in a timely manner, which means member associations have confidence that they can implement what they plan and removes any barriers to implementation. Member associations can adjust funding and resource allocation to achieve the best bang for every single buck. And MAs can plan and adjust their activities to meet local needs and emerging priorities. For example, effective service delivery requires quality staffing at appropriate levels. MAs, member associations, can now hire locum doctors and nurses as needed to supplement full-time staffing. And this means that static clinics can remain open while outreach activities continue. This has been a major driver of growth underneath, under the, first, under the strategy. We're also developing strong capacity in the use of evidence in planning and management decision-making. And we can focus on critical factors for the Pacific, including climate change, gender, non-communicable diseases, and sexual and gender-based violence, just to name a few. The strategy, of course, has also faced some challenges. No strategy, no project is perfect. The pooled funding modality is a challenge for donors who often want to fund specific to find activities. And we would like to sincerely thank DFAT and MFAT for their support and courage in funding a different approach. The projected funding for 2019 was also not realized in our first year because of this difficulty of funding and we had less funding available to deliver more. We also didn't have the funding to launch all of the areas that we wanted to under the first year of the strategy. So we'll do that in a phased approach. In Thank you, Karen. Uh, you have Sorry. two more minutes left. I thought I had 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Right, so some of the achievements in 2019, which I think are really important, is that we were able to um, achieve an, over an 8% increase in the total number of services and referrals provided, over 10% increase in the number of SRH to non-SRH services provided, over 8.5% in the increase in the total number of clients, and 35% increase in mobile clinics. Um, services and a 40% increase in the number of young people reached and a 75% increase in the number of clients with a disability and we had some um, areas where we didn't increase but there were actually reasons for that but the most important thing was why the improvements it's and basically, that 
The differences are in the strategic approach compared to the project approach. Member associations have the autonomy to determine their own priorities and to respond to emerging needs. Member associations can focus on enabling local and community-based service delivery and demand creation, putting the services where they're needed most. There's improved collaboration and learning across the development humanitarian nexus and an increase in mobile outreach services and activities. And also, we have really increased the visibility for member associations which has led to improved partnerships with national governments and growing donor confidence in Pacific member associations. So where to from here? Before the strategy, IPPF mostly was operating in, the, in its comfort zone. The new VARCA strategy has moved us to the realm of where the magic happens. And we, tend, we intend to keep creating magic so that people in the Pacific are free to make choices about their sexuality and wellbeing without discrimination. How far we can go? The sky's the limit and we'll keep you posted. And finally, I'd just like to say a very warm thanks to everyone who's contributed to the new Barker Pacific strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And uh, I do believe it's a lesson learned for all of us, the work that the sub-regional office Pacific that it is doing in terms of aiming to support its member associations across the Pacific in a holistic and integrated way to build their capacity and sustainability, as well as uh, the emphasis on social inclusion and diversity and accountability. Thank you so much. A locally owned strategy with MAs prioritizing and responding to local needs that covers both development and humanitarian spheres. Menaka Karen, uh, I now have the, the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Helen Henderson. She is the Health Systems Manager at Maristops Timor-Leste and is a second year PhD candidate at the University of Melbourne. Helen will be presenting findings from a participatory qualitative research project on access to male family planning methods in Timor-Leste. Helen. Well, thank you for the wonderful introduction. It's really exciting to be here today talking about findings from a qualitative participatory research project about access to male family planning methods in Timor. So I, I'm Helen, I'm a university student at, at um, Melbourne University. I'm also the health systems manager at Myrie Stopes Timor-Leste, MSTL. MSTL is the leading provider of family planning services in Timor-Leste. We work in partnership with the Ministry of Health and with support from the Australian Government. So this research project is funded through the Australian Government. I'm part of a large research team, um, so acknowledgements and many thanks to my colleagues here on the slide, including my uh, three fantastic supervisors based in Timor-Leste and Australia. I would like to acknowledge um, one colleague in particular, Silvina, we had planned to co-present together in uh, Cambodia. So although unfortunate that that couldn't happen, it's really wonderful be, to be here today. So really big thanks to everyone who's made this online series possible. And of course, thank you to everyone for listening today. So the uptake of male family planning methods in Timor-Leste is low, and we don't have a lot of evidence about why? So we designed and conducted, um, conducted collaborative participatory research to explore just that. So the aim of the research is to provide new evidence that can be used to inform policy and programmatic decision making. And this is really important because we know that the meaningful engagement of men is really important for improving the sexual and reproductive health and rights of all people. So men play a really important role of being supportive partners in the uptake of family planning services and also a really important role as users of family planning services. So firstly, Timor. So Timor-Leste is a beautiful island nation. It has incredible oceans, majestic mountains. It's a very culturally and linguistically diverse, vibrant and rich country. It does have a long history of occupation and colonisation. 
It's one of the youngest nations in the world. It got its independence during a referendum held in just 1999. It's also one of the youngest populations in the world with a median age of just 17.4 years. It's also predominantly Catholic. Uh, I myself, I'm an Australian, so I'm very privileged to live and work there. And I highly recommend in the post COVID-19 world when everyone is able to travel freely and safely that everyone um, pays a visit to this really special country. So something that Timor can really be proud about is huge improvements to the sexual and reproductive health indicators over the last decade. In particular, they've done a really good job at reducing maternal mortality rates. This slide here that I'm showing is just some data from the most recent demographic health survey. I don't need to repeat the data because we've heard it twice already showing how important it is. But in Timor, one in five married women have an unmet need for contraception. So obviously this is an area that we do need to focus more energy and resources into. So that's for married women. What about men? So for starters, what is, what are male family planning methods? Male family planning methods are methods of family planning that require men's direct participation or cooperation for use. So that includes male sterilization or vasectomy. It includes condoms, withdrawal, and some other fertility awareness methods that have a defined protocol for use. Globally, uh, the use of male family planning methods accounts for about 25% of contraceptive use worldwide. In Timor, vasectomy use is formally reported at 0%. And the use of condoms and natural family planning is also quite low at less than 2%. So there's many reasons why uptake of family planning varies so much around the world. Um, many factors including availability of services, also social influences, also individual beliefs and understanding. So our research project was to designed to explore just that um, for male family planning in the Timor setting. So between August to December last year in 2019, we travelled to seven municipalities to conduct in-depth individual interviews with 24 healthcare, pro care, healthcare providers. Um, that involves semi-structured interviews and also body mapping activities. We also conducted 14 participatory group discussions, PGDs, with 91 women and 84 men. And during those sessions, the PGDs, uh, we would start together, women and men together, we would break up into gender disaggregated groups and conduct body mapping activities, vignettes or short stories, and also a discussion about family planning. We would then come back together to finish the session off um, with men and women together. And today I've just highlighted it in blue on this slide here. I will be focusing on the body mapping activities we conducted during the PGDs. So the body mapping process itself. So once we're in our gender disaggregated groups, um, we handed out these pieces of paper with a blank, uh, with a blank template of the male and the female body. You can see it up on the left hand side of that screen. We would give each participant a blue pen and we would ask everyone to please mark, draw or write uh, any sexual and reproductive health organs or systems that they knew about. We would then give everyone a green pen and ask them to please write, draw or mark any family planning methods they knew about. Finally, the red pen, which was to mark, draw or write any side effects or impacts from people's use of family planning methods. We would then go and have a very brief one-on-one -on -one discussion between the participant and a researcher about their body maps. So uh, we would get from this process that the completed body map itself and also the audio recording of, of the partic participant describing what they had done on their body map. And those two photos on the bottom just show the process of our research team going through those body maps and listening to the audio recordings. And I'm very pleased to share some of our findings today from, from this really interesting process. 
So this first body map I'm showing, it's from an older female participant in a rural location. She is one of the many participants that didn't identify or discuss any male methods of family planning. She did, however, identify three methods of female family planning. You can see if, if you've got good eyesight today, you can see three little green dots on the female template on the left. And she had identified and discussed the implant, injectable contraceptive and the IUD. This next body map, this was done by a younger female participant in an urban setting. Uh, this is one of, of a few really interesting body maps in which a female method of contraception was identified on the male body. So male use of a female contraceptive. You can see here written in green, uh, it's the injectable contraception, uh, injectable contraception. And we had this several times from several participants um, for the injectable contraception, but also for implants and contraceptive pills. And this, of course, this opens a really rich and uh, interesting conversation around gender and also reproductive health decision making. This next body map that I'm showing was quite a unique body map from within our large sample. Um, this was from a younger male in an urban setting, and you can see that he had very, um, quite a lot to draw and write and quite a lot to say. And interesting here is he's one of the very, very few participants we found that could identify and discuss the vasectomy method of male family planning. He also identified condoms as a method to prevent pregnancy. And this was quite interesting in our study as not many people identify condoms as a method to prevent pregnancy. Interestingly, in other parts of the PGD session, condoms were identified and discussed as a method of preventing sexually transmitted infections. So this suggests that perhaps there's some good work going on about the role condoms play in the prevention of STIs, perhaps not so much yet about the role condoms play in the prevention of pregnancy. This next slide has two body maps on the one slide. And it's just to show some of the conversations we had around natural methods of family planning. On the left, we had an older male participant um, from a rural location identify quite a lot, um, quite a number of family planning methods, including natural family planning for just the female, not for the male. And then on the right hand side, we have a younger female participant from an urban setting, and she had identified and discussed natural family planning for both the female and the male participant. Now, overall, we found that the body mapping process was a very effective way of exploring family planning methods in, in Timor. Uh, it has been done before, and so we were able to build and grow on previous lessons learned. Um, overall, uh, we were able to identify many barriers to the access and uptake of family planning through this process, um, including the limited knowledge and awareness about male family planning methods. Also many barriers related to gender, age, availability of methods, marital status, uh, location played into it absolutely through availability and also the perceived and real side effects from family planning methods. So we're nowhere near finished our work. Um, I'm pleased to say we have quite a lot more to do. So next step for us, uh, member checking. So we do need to take all our findings back to our um, wonderful participants and all the key stakeholders that fed into this research. We need to share what we find and, and hear their thoughts on, on what we think. Um, we've got a lot more analysis, analysis to do and of course plenty of writing and sharing. Uh, just that little dot point on the end there is also a really important one to note for us is that uh, this is a very rigorous study, but more than just an academic process, this is operational research. So we are using findings to inform our health promotion activities, also team training for educators and healthcare providers, and also for project design. Uh, so a very practical piece of work. 
And finally, if you have any suggestions or questions, would like to hear more about what we're doing, please feel free to reach out to myself or anyone in the research team. We would really love to hear from you. And that's over and out for me. So thank you everybody for uh, listening. Thank you so much, Helen. And uh, thank you so much for your PGD maps. Uh, it goes to show the effective use of body maps to capture knowledge and understanding uh, of different populations, not only in Timor-Leste, but maybe something that we can also use in our different countries and contextualize those on family planning methods. And it also highlighted the gaps and opportunities on intersectional issues such as gender and age that can be integrated into programming. Thank you so much for, for those uh, insights. Uh, I now will turn to Dr. Michelle O'Connor, uh, a very familiar name and a familiar face as I see her come on uh, video. Um, Michelle O'Connor holds a PhD in public health and has 15 years of experience in working in sexual and reproductive health in the United Kingdom, Australia, and the Asia and Pacific region. She currently manages the International Division of the Australasian Society for HIV, Viral Hepatitis, and Sexual Health Medicine. Dr. O'Connor will present findings of a study on adolescent sexual and reproductive well-being in the Republic of Fiji. There you go. The floor is yours, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. I'll just share my screen. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, so I'll be talking today about a study I conducted um, between 2015 and 2018 in Fiji. It was part of my PhD thesis. Um, and the study is looking at the meaning of sexual and reproductive well-being in Fiji for adolescents. And when I, I'm talking about adolescents here, I'm talking about 15 to 19 year olds. So obviously adolescence covers a broader age, age range. Um, the rationale for the study is that you know, one in 10 Fijians are within the age bracket of 15 to 19. And in Fiji, but also I think in other countries, the concept of well-being when we think about sex and relationships is not really clearly defined. We often focus on a disease approach, um, and look at health outcomes, which is obviously incredibly important, but, but not so much around the more well-being side, the feeling good, the thriving um, side of things. And there's no tool to actually measure what adolescent sexual and reproductive well-being is. So I had four research questions, um, and they were, what does adolescent sexual and reproductive well-being mean in Fiji? How is it shaped by the socio-cultural and structural factors? How is it experienced? and how can it be measured and improved. Um, and I'm going to run through the findings today. Obviously, it's quite a lot of, of uh, air, like research questions and can be quite in depth. So I can only really do a surface level presentation, but very happy to answer any questions as well. Um, so here is beautiful Fiji on the map. Um, I was very lucky to live there for two years prior to the PhD. Um, and for this study, I used a mixed method approach uh, where I carried out in-depth surveys, uh, sorry, in-depth interviews with 40 key informants um, that work with adolescents. And I held 14 focus group discussions with about 86 adolescents across four different locations, two urban, two rural. Um, that was Kandavu, Namuwalu, Suba, and uh, Nandi. And then following that, I ran a survey um, online with 196 adolescents. So in terms of the findings, uh, you know, the question, what does well-being mean for young people and those that work with young people when we think about their, their sexuality and their um, reproductive lives? And for young people, it's really about love and intimacy, positive feelings, about pleasure, feeling confident in oneself, feeling attractive, um, feeling that they can make decisions around their own health and their own behaviours um, and having a high self-esteem. And we found that you know, condomless sex is one way of expressing love, feeling intimacy and pleasure. Um, so obviously that's a, a challenge, but a really, you know, I think it's an area which often gets neglected to kind of um, like pleasure issues and, and, and the more uh, feelings around self-reflection and, and feeling good about oneself that comes into relationships. Uh, it was also around having 
being socially accepted and to, to experience that there was a kind of need to conform or people felt there was a need to conform to social cultural expectations um, and this is demonstrated by Louisa an Itoke health worker in a rural area who says that adolescents hardly come for condoms they may be afraid to take contraceptives because of stigma in the community you know the Fijian mentality they hear somebody hey that one is taking and then people gossip about ladies so um, you know we found fear of uh, lack of confidentiality in health services to be a big drive for young people not accessing health services um, because they're afraid that that if their sexual behaviors were seen to not conform to social norms such as only having sex once married um, or not having same-sex relationships then they wouldn't be accepted within their community and again obviously this is a uh, something that is not just uh, specific or special to Fiji it's uh, an issue all around um, the world as we know um, I did want to bring in gender dynamics briefly here and I think I've painted uh, the issue in with two very black and white um, quotes and obviously it's a much more gray area um, but just to illustrate the point we have Paul a, a young Itoke boy he said for us in Fijian culture if you don't have sex you're not man enough so you have to do it and um, this is really the reverse for Jenny, an Itoke girl, who says, well, if a girl's never been, happy, uh, never been kissing a boy, she's healthy. So it kind of demonstrates that um, you know, there's still issues around uh, uh, masculinity and, and masculinity being seen as having sex and, and a sign of um, you know, being masculine is actually engaged in sex, whereas girls, they see it the other way around. Um, so that obviously plays into the kind of the cultural structures and, and, and issues around young people accessing sexual reproductive health services um, and feeling accepted by the community. Young people also felt, and as did obviously stakeholders as well, that being equipped to engage in health seeking behaviours is really important, as well as being able to have access to SRH services um, such as those provided by, by Mark, the Reproductive Health Centre. Um, and I, I really found this quote very interesting um, from Josefa, an Itoke boy, who says that we need more information at school because we don't get to do that stuff because people feel ashamed of saying that stuff. And, and whilst there is comprehensive sexuality education in school, um, talking to young people and teachers, I found that there's still a fear or there is a fear amongst teachers um, and amongst young people to really um, learn about the curriculum and so that's really putting, putting barriers into place to being equipped and having information and um, being able to access SRH services. And finally, young people felt that um, having a supportive social relationship is really a huge component of well-being. Um, and again, that links to you know, acceptance, but also having, having services and support and, and people they can turn to to discuss relationships. Um, and this is demonstrated by Georgia, a young person who identified as a transgender female. The person is always there for a friend who we need most of the time, mostly when we're down. Um, so that just highlights the need for social support and um, supportive social relationships. So I took uh, the information that I gave from the quantitative, uh, qualitative side, sorry, um, and from the focus groups and interviews and used that to develop a scale which asked um which tried to measure adolescent sexual reproductive well-being um, and going as i say beyond the disease focus um, i did include some questions around behaviors because uh, obviously it's still incredibly important but the scale is really trying to look at how young people feel about themselves um, and their futures um, because that is uh, one of the key definitions of well-being um, and I haven't put this up on a, on a slide but by many well-being theory, theorists it's really around um, how you see yourself and perceive your your life so this is an example of uh, one of the areas of the scale that looks at positive emotions and thoughts there were seven statements um, sorry there were seven categories and I think 38 statements in total and adolescents were asked through an online survey to rate how they felt about each statement. So, for example, when I think about having a sexual relationship now in the future, I feel happy. And then they'd say whether they agreed or disagreed with that. And this is just some characteristics of the participants. 
Um, so we can see that the majority of participants were male, um, but we did have a fairly good female representation as well. Um, there was a equal representation across the two different major uh, ethnic groups in Fiji, um, yeah, in Tokyo and the Fijians of Indian descent, and some representation from other ethnicities. Um, the majority did identify as heterosexual, um, though we did have 18 participants identify as LGBT, and, and 29 participants said they didn't know their sexual orientation. And then here you can see that Christians were the majority, followed by Hindus, Muslims, and those of no other religion. So I ran a factor analysis um, on, on the findings and on the 20, uh, 38 items. And the purpose of that is to really identify structures within the items, which help develop a, a concept or a construct. So the five factors that emerged from our findings was that well-being is about having opportunities and confidence to access SRH services, um, is to have agency and resilience, and here we measured it as a lack of agency and resilience and a perceived lack of an environment in which to build them, experiencing self-efficacy, positive emotions, and envisaging a bright future, experiencing difficult emotions and self-evaluation as being, again, a, a negative um, side that prevents or limits well-being, um, and then having social acceptance, belonging and support. <laughs> so, uh, I looked at the mean scores of the results, and I won't go into those in too much detail, but they did range from one to seven, one of usually being the, the, <clears throat> sorry, the, the worst low, well-being, or the lowest, and seven being the sign of good well-being. And so here we can see that young people score five generally. But what I think is more significant is the differences we found between subpopulations. So here we found that uh, when thinking about perceived opportunities and confidence to access services, heterosexual participants scored significantly better than those who didn't know their sexual identity. And those who'd heard of STIs were more likely to report feeling they were able to access SRH services. In terms of feeling positive and optimistic about their current or future relationships, again, heterosexual people identifying as heterosexual and LGBTI scored much better than those who said they didn't know their sexual identity. And for those who had heard of STIs which are, and HIV, they again scored significantly higher than those who hadn't. So showing, it's just showing that knowledge um, helps to feel positive and optimistic, um, but also it's quite interesting to see that perhaps identifying within uh, a community or a particular group may help others, may help people to feel more positive positive about their, their futures in terms of relationships. Um, supportive, having a, a supportive community belonging, uh, I don't think it's a huge surprise that people that identified as heterosexual um, scored better in feeling they had a sense of support, a supportive community and belonging um, than those that didn't know their sexual identity. And those um, <clears throat> that, that were LGBT, um, there wasn't a significant difference in their scores between the heterosexual or those that didn't know their sexual identity. On experiencing difficult emotions, females tended to score worse than males, suggesting that they experienced more difficult emotions, um, or I guess were more willing to show or, or recognise those emotions. And also for genes of Indian descent scored significantly better um, than Itokes and other ethnicities uh, in in feeling, uh, well, in not feeling difficult emotions or feeling more, more positive. Concerns about social and emotional consequences of violating taboos. Um, here we can see that males scored significantly higher than females, indicating that they um, maybe had more concerns about violating taboos, or perhaps, um, as we found in other parts of the survey, females have more people that they are willing to confide in uh, whereas males tend to, to not seek that support. Uh, heterosexual participants, again, identified as less concerned, which again isn't too much of a surprise, compared to LGBT and those who didn't know their sexual identity. So obviously, um, their practices tend to be seen as violating the social um, norm. And when we pulled all those scores together, uh, what we found was, you know, this theme that runs through our, our findings is that those that, um, those that didn't know their sexual identity or, or felt unable to express it scored significantly worse generally in terms of well-being than 
and heterosexual and LGBT participants. Um, and I think those that don't know their sexual identity, it's very common as, a, as an adolescent to not know it or not uh, identify or choose to identify or feel confident to identify um, in a particular way. They're often a group that probably get forgotten or, or lost or um, unsupported by services, whereas we have LGBT communities that exist in Fiji um, that can provide support. We also found that those that had a knowledge of STIs um, definitely um, score better in terms of well-being as compared to those who did not, which obviously emphasises the importance of education. Just to run through quickly some other interesting findings, um, there's generally a high knowledge of STIs and HIV. 53% of those who had um, sex had used contraceptive at the last um, sexual activity, with 29% having taken no action and 18% taking non-medical action. And by that, I mean things like, um, like having a shower after having sexual intercourse or taking herbal medication, something that they thought would prevent pregnancy, but it's very unlikely that it actually Michelle, would. Michelle, you have two more yep. minutes left. Sure. Okay, wonderful. I will skip ahead. Um, just wanted to highlight that 8% of our participants did report experiencing forced sex. Um, and that that was higher for LGBT youth. So generally the scale shows it's got validity, some validity, but we do need to, I do need to um, uh, have, do another validity test on the scale using a different population. Um, but at the moment it does look like it could really offer a way to measure adolescent sexual and reproductive wellbeing. Um, and this is the framework of what that actually means in Fiji. And I'll just very quickly run through some final recommendations that came out of the study. And that was to really use strength-based approaches to empower youth and community to address potentially harmful social norms, um, to have interventions which, which target the vulnerable populations, but including those who don't know their sexual identity, um, and to have greater programs to build emotional resilience and mental support, and to address issues of sexual consent, agency, and violence. Um, to also have health campaigns that recognize the role of pleasure intimacy as drivers of sexual practice, especially condomless sex, um, and to have health workers trained and supported to provide confidential services. Peer education um, was very popular amongst young people, um, and out outreach services were the best way to reach young people. So again, strengthening the peer education system and using it to teach things like emotional resilience and how to navigate um, health services and access contraception. Um, and STI, the pregnancy and sexual assault support. And that's all from me. Thank you very much for listening. The Nakavakilovu to all the participants, to the Fiji Ministry of Health and Medical Services, supervisors, the Pacific community, and everybody else involved in the study. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. We do know that adolescence is a time of great change and growth when young people are negotiating a range of influences work on sexual and reproductive health, which seek to support the well-being and dignity of adolescents and youth in all their diversity, need to give greater consideration to internal and external drivers, such as access to services and information. And I do believe comprehensive sexual education shifts the center away from traditional knowledge, and also the focus on well-being and self-evaluation empowerment is key in personal decision-making. And I'm most certain that this framework will be a great addition to family life education curriculum development and implementation. Thank you once again, Vinaka. Um, Anna Ravendran is Program Officer at Family Planning New Zealand and Kate Burry is a PhD candidate at School of Public Health and Community Medicine in Sydney. They will be presenting on sexual and reproductive health and rights in rural Vanuatu, knowledge, access, and barriers. Anna and Kate. Okay, tēnā koutou katoa. Hello, Geta, and thank you for joining us here today to find out a bit more about Planning Good Family Bloyumi, Family Planning New Zealand's uh, most recent piece of international research looking at knowledge, access, and barriers to family planning in rural Vanuatu. Um, so Family Planning New Zealand um, was founded in 1936 and does focus um, more on domestic services information and training, but also has an international programs team, which this research was um, undertaken under. 
And before we get started, I'll introduce my role in this. So yes, I'm International Program Manager at um, Family Planning New Zealand, and I also oversee the Vanuatu project, which this research was a part of. Um, but I will be co-presenting um, with Kate Burry, so I'll just get her to briefly introduce herself. Kia ora tato, um, at the University of New South Wales, but today I'm speaking um, um, under my previous role as a researcher for Family Planning New Zealand. So, cool. <laughs> Right. Um, so we, yeah, like many of the other sessions, we have limited time, but we'll do our best to cover as much content as we can. Um, but to let you know that we do have the a report available electronically online on our website, and we've got a link on the last slide of our presentation. So today we'll briefly look at the background, the context of the research, the key findings, the recommendations, um, and then before kind of wrapping up um, today. So just to know as well that these recommendations have been incorporated both within um, a project that family planning is a part of um, but obviously this is um, something that we hope um, many organizations take on board to help achieve um, great so so yes as i was briefly alluding to there before um this research was a part of a larger project called Planim Good Family Blue Yumi, which in Bislama, a language in Vanuatu, means to plan our families well. And so this, oops, sorry. Um, so the long-term outcome of this is to reduce unplanned pregnancies and STIs among Ni Vanuatu people. And the locations in which it focuses is in the north of the country. So specifically North Santo, Torres, Gawa and South Pentecost. The duration of the project was originally for two years, but we've since got second, um, a second uh, phase of funding. So it takes us from 2018 through to 2023. And the partners, as well as Family Planning New Zealand, is the Vanuatu Family Health Association, who does all the crucial implementation of the project and also helped do um, some really important data collection for this piece of research. And both the larger project and this research was funded by the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So Vanuatu then, I think everyone on this call probably is aware where Vanuatu sits, but Vanuatu is a South Pacific country with approximately 80 islands, with close to 70 of them populated. And the population is a total of approximately 285,000, with 80% of those people living rurally and 57% under the age of 25 years. So Vanuatu's SRHR statistics, I won't go into much detail because it is similar to some of the other presentations, but much like other areas of the Pacific, Vanuatu faces high rates of STIs, unwanted pregnancies, and also intimate partner violence. And there is an unmet need for family planning that remains. And of course, these outcomes can be very much gendered impacting women um, disproportionately more. And by meeting unmet needs, these unmet needs, we would see approximately a 54% decline in high risk births, a drop in unintended pregnancies, and also a net saving of approximately $80 million. So again, so many reasons to invest in SRHR. So the context of this specific piece of research, where the arrow points to, Big Bay Bush, is where the data collection was undertaken. Um, and this is on the largest island of Vanuatu, Espiritu Santo. And so the reason we chose this location is, is because it's within um, one of the same locations as the larger project, but also it's a rural location. And rural locations in Vanuatu, those populations do face disproportionately worse SRHR statistics than their urban counterparts. And there's not a lot of research on this particular area or rural communities in general. So Big Bay Bush is an inland area, dispersed and also remote, as I was saying before. And it is serviced mostly by one particular clinic, Saramodi Clinic. And at the time of the research, this had one midwife, one dresser and two nursing support staff. And to give an idea of the distances that they have to go, it's about, you know, seven hours on foot to reach some of these communities. So I'll now pass on to Kate, who will go into more detail on the methods, the key findings, and the recommendations of this research. Thank you. Kia ora, Kate. Kia ora, Anna. Thank you very much. Um, alrighty, so um, 
just really briefly, yeah, this was a, this was a qualitative uh, piece of research. So um, using focus groups, that was um, our, our colleagues in Vanuatu from the Vanuatu Family Health Association led those male and female focus groups of different age groups. Uh, 12 in-depth interviews with women, which I conducted in Bislama, and then interviews with um, stakeholders and health workers. So you can see down the bottom here, uh, the interviews and focus groups covered um, a lot of content around family planning use, STI, HIV, um, condom use, puberty, relationships, consent, um, gaps, uh, challenges to accessing SRH services. So there was a lot of findings and I'm gonna, I'm gonna just sort of go through them as quickly as possible today. Thank you, Anna. Cool, so um, some of the overall findings. Uh, so we found that, that a lot of women had accessed and had used um, family planning where possible. So that included um, the modern contraceptives that, that were available to people, as well as some um, traditional uh, methods that, it, that were usually derived from um, plant matter. And people with differing views on, on how effective these methods were. Um, in addition, um, many people noted in terms of the benefits of, of contraceptives, um, many people noted the maternal health benefits of um, pregnancy spacing, for example, um, as, well as, as well as lowered living costs. Um, those, those were the kind of key um, benefits to family planning that people spoke about. We also noted, though, that there was, um, there was some um, gaps as well in people's um, knowledge, for example, regarding um, reproductive anatomy, um, regarding sexual activity as well. So that, that largely came, from, came out of the in-depth interviews. And this was um, regarding, for example, um, women's first sexual experiences and not having really any prior um, knowledge or conversations about what was going to happen um, or what could happen or what the possibilities were, um, as well as um, limited knowledge around being able to explore their own sexual feelings and that kind of thing. So when it came to the first, their first sexual experiences, they were fairly distressing because um, a lot of people, women described not quite knowing what was going on. Um, so issues of, of consent and, and everything in that as well. Um, yes, um, STIs um, and family planning, um, a lot of, and this has already been mentioned um, as well, a lot of um, rumours and misinformation, um, for example, that some methods of family planning and that condoms could cause um, cancers, uh, could cause uh, inf um, infertility, and those kind of um, fairly significant concerns. Um, as well as that, and we've already kind of mentioned this, and others have mentioned these as issues, um, quite significant levels of intimate um, partner and sexual violence, including cause of control. Thank you, Anna. So here's a, a quote from um, one of the focus groups. Family planning is a good thing because it can be used to space your children when you have one child, when they're four or five, you can have another child. So that kind of points to one of the key um, uses of family planning, which is to space pregnancies rather than to delay the first pregnancy. So regarding barriers, we kind of got two themes. Um, the first one is social barriers. Um, I've already mentioned myths and misinformation, which was really, really common. Um, also issues around, um, I guess, lack of um, access to information. So from the perspective of the nurse, for example, and the midwife at the clinic, it was really hard for her in amongst her um, clinic duties to be able to also go in and, and, and sit down with communities or and answer people's questions about everything that they had questions about. So um, that, was, that was a significant issue. And it wasn't because people didn't want to know. It was more that it was just really a really big challenge. Um, reproductive decision making. This is um, quite a large one as, as, as well. Um, but I guess one way that it could be summarized is that um, the decisions about uh, family planning use, for example, were not limited to the people, the, the person whose body it concerned. So um, women, for example, um, often spoke about deferring to the reproductive goals of their partners and of their families. That's not to say that women didn't act on what they wanted to do around how many children and, and that kind of thing. Um, certainly there were stories of even women going and, and, and accessing family planning um, in secret, but that's, um, that was quite a, quite a significant thing. 
social stigma and embarrassment, um, we've, we've, we all kind of know of that. So I won't talk um, just to say that it was absolutely real and also issues, um, work, concerns about confidentiality and gender and sexual based, um, gender based and sexual violence was really, really common as well. And um, in terms of women's experiences and also um, we found in the focus groups with men very much um, normalized in the way that, that, that it was spoken about. Thanks, Anna. So um, this, is, this is a quote from an in-depth interview um, regarding uh, reproductive decision-making. When he said one more child, I felt tired. I was tired, but I said, okay, that's fine because that's what he wanted. Because if we don't listen to him, there will still, he will have bad thoughts. Um, so thinking badly of her, for example. So um, finally, just the, the structural barriers. So um, infrastructure, transportation, some really key, um, key yeah, um, um, issues around accessing the actual clinic. So um, Anna's already mentioned that this was a really dispersed population and not everywhere is accessible by road. Um, so yeah, we're talking, we're talking quite significant hikes. Um, women shared in the in-depth interviews with me um, being in labor and having to, to hike if they wanted a, um, um, a, a birth to be attended by the, by the midwife at the clinic. Um, also only one truck services the clinic um, and there's also issues um, We've already heard about the, the kind of significant rates of um of kind of um, climate kind of issues um in, in the Pacific. So um flooding was quite a common issue, flooding of the river, which um inhibits access as well. Um infrastructure um in the clinic as well as um reliable supply of family planning commodities was a really significant and and an issue that was brought up quite a lot. And the quote on the next slide, um kind of addresses this in a, in a very real way. So this was from one of the health workers. Okay, to be honest, since the start of the year, 2018, the mothers who gave birth in September, August, July, and so on, this was because last year we were short of pills. They don't want these children, they don't want to be pregnant, but there weren't any pills. This was a really big challenge. So that speaks to the, the issue around the, the supply, but also um, the outcomes. Of, of that um, that this health worker had noted. Thank you, Anna. Right, so um, these are the recommendations that came out of all of these discussions with these community members. Um, so yeah, um, I, I won't go through them. These are in the report, but they largely fall into kind of um, educational um, health promotion components, as well as healthy relationships. Other researchers mentioned similar, similar themes and recommendations. Um, and peer education, um, and then then also addressing some of the um, the practical barriers that people also brought up. So around access, around um, having a variety of supplies, um, and also enough supplies of um, different commodities, and some training with service providers as well. So um, on the next slide, that's the, um, the link to. Um, the report with, with, with much more detailed information about all of the findings um, and the methods and, and everything like that. So um, that's, that's all from us, but thank you very much um, again for listening and thanks also to the other presenters. I really, really enjoyed listening to what everyone, um, other people's research and insights and, and all that. So thanks very much. Very much so. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes, thank you, Anna and Kate. Yeah, uh, I do. I do totally agree with Planum Good Family Belong You Me. And um, I, I, of course, uh, have uh, heard the study how it highlights community and health systems that uh, ought to be considered by policy makers, planners, and implementer, implementers in the design of family planning and contraceptive programs to ensure sustained uptake and increased met needs. Uh, as well as uh, tackling the health systems in inhibiting factors such as negative provider attitudes, gaps in sustained commodity and su services supply together with the infrastructure. And of course, addressing community level factors such as stigma, myths, and negative beliefs that will require full engagement of community members and of course, uh, information, education, 
and communication so that they may be informed and be able to make those um, informed decisions. Thank you so much. And uh, to our final speaker, Olanike Adedeji. She is the technical specialist for reproductive health commodity security at the uh, United Nations Population Fund, Pacific Subregional Office in Suva, Fiji. Nike has also supervised several health and development projects in her native Nigeria. Nike will be presenting on a roadmap to achieving zero unmet need in the Pacific. Over to you, Nike. Hola, everyone, and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak today about the roadmap to achieving um, unmet need in the Pacific. As you well know, um, UNFPA, one of our aspirational goals is to help women to um, women globally to be able to achieve their reproductive intentions. And one of that is to have uh, zero unmet need by 2030, which uh, is what we are doing right now in the Pacific. So before I start, I would first of all like to acknowledge um, a lot of colleagues who are working behind the scene on making this possible. Uh, first of all, to Avenue Health and to Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for the funds that was um, available to the UNFPA Supplies Program for this work. And specifically to two colleagues, uh, Dr. Lubemga Adela King and Ben Light uh, in uh, the Cairo Regional Office, as well as our office in Belgium, who worked together with Avenir Health um, in the country ca categorization model that I'm going to be talking about. So, so that's the outline of the presentation and uh, we'll be doing a deep dive into Solomon Islands in this particular presentation. So a lot of people have talked uh, before me about the um, issue of unmet need globally as well as in the Pacific. So as at 2015, about 64% of married women in the world uh, are able to use a method of contraception compared to 39% in the Pacific. And if we look at what has happened in recent times in 2019, as we have begun to track more than just married women, but all women uh, globally, you would see that only 48.5% of all women are able to access uh, contraception compared to 28% in most of the low income countries. So uh, unmet need is particularly high in the Pacific, as has been mentioned, and this is very troubling. And I think the fact that the remoteness of a number of the outer islands and the Pacific Island countries have also continued to pose a challenge to uh, access to sexual reproductive health services. And we are going to be looking at a number of uh, data around the Pacific. And you will see that uh, the data in the Pacific indicates that OMET need is particularly high amongst those who are 15 to 19 years old. And, uh, what we have done in terms of this um, um, assessment is to look at the mapping. And like I said, it's a global piece of work, uh, mapping and analysis of uh, unmet need around uh, the regions and as around countries. And then in the phase two of the uh, methodology, we were looking at the inventory of evidence of um, interventions that can deliver high impact uh, including case studies. And in the third phase, we were beginning to look at identifying accelerators and then developing a roadmap for uh, regions as well as countries on how to achieve zero unmet need. And this is what we have called the categorization model. So uh, the categorization model uh, has sought to try to identify areas where countries can accelerate progress towards reducing unmet need. And we have been able to group countries together based on this um, unmet need. And what we've done is to categorize countries across five categories. I'm going to show you the model shortly. And we know that even in grouping, that countries will not share the same path uh, in terms of uh, the unmet need. But what we are trying to see is uh, what are those common barriers and opportunities 
that are common out across these countries and then find those opportunities for investments that can help countries to achieve um, zero uh, omitment. So um, in the categorization model, uh, there are five themes and those themes are enabling the environment, fulfilling reproductive health intentions, securing supplies, enabling access for all and uh, leaving no one behind. So for things around the um, FP, en enabling policy, for example, we're looking at policy environment for family planning, restrictive policies for youth. In terms of fulfilling reproductive intentions, we're looking at how to increase demand. Uh, in terms of securing supplies, we're looking at commodity availability and commodity security. In terms of enabling access, we're also looking at things like quality of service, as well as uh, rights-based access and healthcare provider coverage. And in terms of leaving no one behind, we're specifically looking at youth access and some sub-national disparities and access, especially in humanitarian context, which is uh, one of the peculiarities for the Pacific. So um, you will notice that there are quite a number of um, items on this particular slide. It's to tell you the intensity of the work that went behind the scene into the model. Across each of this model, we're able to identify the data sources where we would be um, doing the analysis. I will go on now to show you what the categorization model looks like in terms of unmet need projected by 2030. And uh, you will find out for the Pacific, you'll find uh, Marshall Islands in the low to middle, 10 to 14 percent. You will find Cook Islands, Fiji, and Vanuatu to around the 15 to 20 percent. And in the 20 to 24 percent, you will find uh, Solomon Islands. And in the 25% and above, you would find uh, Samoa and Tonga. And for us in UNFPA, we have um, uh, a flagship project called the UNFPA Supplies. We were able to see that those countries that we are actually supporting in this project fall in the highest unmet, unmet need areas, which um, goes on to reinforce the reason why we're doing all these interventions. So uh, based on this work, we have this huge FP database and we have developed FP country opportunity briefs for each of the countries. And th those snapshots are designed to be able to use for ad advocacy, evidence-based advocacy. And we are hoping that countries will be able to make use of this uh, database and briefs in their advocacy. So um, in the deep dive, into Solomon Islands. Uh, some of us who are familiar in the Pacific with the Solomon Islands, the fact that this has over 900 islands spread over 1.3 million square kilometers. And what we have found uh, with uh, Solomon Islands is that a number of the indices have been uh, going in the opposite direction as uh, not what is expected, especially for contraceptive prevalence. Uh, even uh, for unmet need, it continues to go up. Uh, adolescent birth rate continues to increase. However, we have seen a reduction in the total fertility rate between 2007 and 2015, even though it's uh, somewhat marginal. But we've done a mapping of all the health facilities in Solomon Islands, and that tells you that there are about 351 health facilities where women can receive family planning services in Solomon Islands. But what has uh, come to our attention is that if you look at the data from the DHS and you look at unmet need in 2007 compared to 2015, you would see that it has increased significantly um, in those years. However, if you look at the issue around planned and unplanned pregnancies in Solomon Islands, you will see that more and more women are beginning to have planned pregnancies and less unplanned pregnancies. And we have still seen a, a significant difference between the total uh, fertility rate and the wanted fertility rate. So women are still having um, at least one more child than they actually uh, plan to have. Uh, over the next few slides, I'm just going to gloss over because it's a lot of details, but you will have a chance to take a look at the slides much later and deep dive into that. Uh, with these slides, what we're trying to show is that Data is not homogeneous. 
And in order to understand what is happening to unmet need, we need to go beyond the surface. So in these slides, you would see analysis of differences between um, teenagers 15 to 19 compared to all women of reproductive age 15 to uh, 49. We've looked at the wealth quantile, we've looked at um, their residence in terms of urban, rural, and as well as their education. And uh, what we have been able to uh, understand from this deep dive into the data from the DHS is that um, unmet, even though unmet need had con con continued to uh, increase, but you will see that it has declined amongst married women, but unmet need is still significantly high amongst those who have secondary education. However, there is no difference really in terms of unmet need based on wealth. And you will notice that there's a higher unmet need amongst those who, uh, amongst women who live uh, in urban locations. In the same way, we have done an analysis of the modern contraceptive prevalence rate, also a deep dive across the different uh, disaggregations that I've mentioned earlier. And you would see that CPR is somewhat higher amongst women uh, in rural areas and lower for those who have no education and those who have secondary education. And we have seen some decline amongst uh, those who are aged 15 to 19, comparing um, the DHS of 2007 to the 2015 data. And also the DHS has indicated that only about 60% of women were informed about side effects uh, uh, when they were counseled about family planning. And one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why women are not using family planning in Solomon Islands, according to them, is the fear of side effects. So this continues to show us some of the issues that are related to um, unmet need. Also, um, if we look at the supplies of uh, contraceptive uh, since 2014, you would see a continued increase in the contribution of Jadel to the couple year protection in Solomon Island. So more and more women are adopting Jadel uh, in Solomon Island. So in summary, uh, the unmet need has tripled. Total demand uh, has doubled without a significant increase in CPR. There are very high discontinuation rates um, in Solomon Islands. Unmet need is still very high amongst adolescents and women in rural areas appear to have a higher CPR than those in urban areas. So by putting all the data into the, um, into the database, we were able to generate these, uh, what we call prioritization briefs that help us to uh, advise countries on where investments should go in Solomon Islands, for example. So here you would see that uh, in terms of the snapshots of the headlines, you would see that in Solomon Islands it's projected that 23% of married women will have unmet need by 2030, and 39% of these are under the age of 25. So that helps us to think about how do we want to program and what kind of investments are best in this case. So let's take a deep dive into the summary of the prioritizations. Uh, and I'm sure you'll be able to have access to these slides to look into some of those areas after now. So in terms of enabling environment, a huge area is um, the youth policy. There's uh, an opportunity for investment in the youth policy in, able, in order to enable access for young people in Solomon Islands. And there's also a high potential for acceleration. I will tell you a little bit more about that. But one of the things you will notice is a lot of great areas on this slide, which shows that data was not available. And one of the things we have been doing is supporting Solomon Islands to be able to have data to inform some of this uh, prioritization. So I will go quickly to the issue about fulfilling reproductive health intentions. So based on the 2015 DHS, you will see that there is still um, a number of women having more children than they plan to have. And this gives us a gap which can be filled to increase uh, based on the demand curve, the maximum CPR that is possible in Solomon Islands if we're able to enable these women to have uh, the ideal number of children that they would like to have. And in terms of securing supplies, a number of data that was put into this model 
but most of them were from uh, focus group discussions with some providers. Uh, one of the things we are going to be doing before the end of this year is supporting Solomon Islands to have a health facility readiness assessment that will also help us to get some data about stock availability in the country. But based on the DHS, as of 2015, a number of women were using, about 31% of them were using the sterilization methods. But you would see from what I had presented earlier that more and more women are beginning to adopt Jadel. So it will be interesting to see what the next DHS will be showing in Solomon Islands about the uh, method mix. Then in terms of the quality of service, you can see um, the score for Solomon Islands in terms of the number of nurses. Doctors and midwives are available to provide services by 10,000 of population, which uh, creates um, the fact that there is still a great need to have more healthcare workers in uh, Solomon Islands to provide these services. And like I mentioned before also, the issue about side effects, there still needs to be a lot more work around uh, providing um, information to women who are using um, contraceptives or who want to adopt contraceptives. So to close, I'll be talking about uh, the policy recommendations. There are only six of them on this slide, but um, in the work that we've done, we actually identified 25 policy recommendations. So um, in terms of the enabling environment, um, Creating a sustainability strategy is going to be very useful to the countries in the Pacific uh, to integrate health budgeting processes and make sure that there are funding to continue to provide uh, uh, family planning services even without uh, donor funding. In terms of fulfilling reproductive health intentions, there's the need to continue to analyze and assess uh, the coverage and the impacts of the programs. In terms of securing the supplies and expanding choice, uh, like has been mentioned by one of the earlier presenters, we also need to address the distribution and reliability of access to uh, contraceptives as well as other um, life-saving medicines in humanitarian settings. Uh, in terms of the right-based family planning services, we need to strengthen the capacity of providers and to promote uh, client autonomy to be able to choose methods uh, that they would like to use. And a lot of work still needs to be done to make sure that no one is left behind by enabling uh, the policy and legal frameworks to ensure the participation of young people and equitable uh, access to sexual reproductive health services and information. And one of the big ticket items is on data availability. As you've seen here, we cannot look at the data from the DHS at national level as sufficient. We need to be able to disaggregate the data, but also to have uh, monitoring data that continues to tell us what is happening in each of these countries in terms of access to family planning, as well as the data on, on me. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And I look forward to your questions and I hope you also get a chance to engage in looking at the documents which will be made available for you. I've only talked about Solomon Islands. We actually have this data available for 14 uh, Pacific Island countries. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nikke. Uh, your presentation shows how UNFP is working to improve uh, sexual and reproductive health commodities supply chain in the Pacific to ensure the family planning demands of women of reproductive age are met without disruption, whether in stable times or in emergencies, which in turn reduces unmet contraceptive needs and improve maternal health outcomes by reducing total and adolescent fertility rates and maternal mortality. It's great that this analysis is available on a database accessible to, to the public to enable data-driven programming and advocacy. Thank you so much. And that are all our panel pre presenters. Thank you once again for your amazing work and efforts. Uh, as my closing statement, I would like to emphasize that we must invest in sexual and reproductive health and rights, women's empowerment, and gender equality to ensure no one is left behind. We need better data, evidence in the Pacific, 
Therefore, we welcome more research on family planning needs. We must expand the coverage of sexual and reproductive health care to women, youth, rural and marginalized populations to improve the health and economic resilience and productivity of individuals, families and communities. We must combat discrimination and violence against women and girls and people in all diversity. <laughs> Further, we need to address prevailing intersecting discrimination and inequalities of women and girls of youth and marginalized communities. We, civil society organizations, feminist activists, non-governmental organizations and communities need to work together to demand for the accessibility and availability of comprehensive sexual and reproductive health information and services. Together, we must ensure that reproductive health is part of every Pacific Island country's development and poverty reduction plan integrated into the primary health system and national budgets. I want to thank the organizers of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights for giving us this platform to amplify our situation in the Pacific. Thanks to my good friend, Dr. Vashivon, for this opportunity. And thanks to all of you who contributed to making this discussion a very lively one. Binakavakalevu and Nisa Mode, I now pass the mic to Shoba for the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Ma. And uh, we have the open session. Uh, we have very little time, but we have already got some questions uh, for our presenters. And uh, I think others who want to, uh, they can uh, directly write the questions to the presenters. So uh, the first question is for Karen. And uh, this is a question from somebody from Fiji. And uh, is there enough focus from public and private sectors in the Pacific? to raise awareness on depression and suicide during this time of crisis of the pandemic and also for the care and protection of marginalized, marginalized communities in isolated uh, areas during the lockdown. Karen. Uh, that's, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think the data really says it all. Uh, there's room for public sector, private sector, civil society organisations to all pull together to do more to reduce um, the situation that we find in the Pacific and move towards unmet need. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if there's anyone else, any of the other presenters who would like to jump on board and also make some comment on these questions. Yes, so if anybody else would like to comment on it. Yes. Any other presenters? And, all right, we have a question for Helen. Uh, first of all, there have been many comments that uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the body line, uh, uh, the uh, body mapping which you have used is a great tool. And the question is, and it is from more than one person, about the community response to male contraceptive in your research. Because it is seen that even in uh, many parts of the world, male contraceptive use is very low. So is it true for all other countries in the Pacific also? And what efforts are being made uh, to ensure that the onus of family planning is not just on women? Helen. Great. Well, thank you for the question. Um, well, to start with, the, uh, when we did our research, we had the expectation that there would be overall low um, understanding and acknowledgement of, of male family planning methods. So we worked it into our research that towards the end of our participatory group discussions, we did share and present um, the different kinds of male family planning methods available and a little bit of information about them. Uh, and when we did this, we got a really diverse um, response from men, women, young people, old people in all different locations. And the responses included surprise, disbelief. Uh, some people thought it was great. 
Some women thought it was about time that men took on the responsibility. Some men felt that they had that responsibility to take that on. However, there were also many concerns. So people expressed concerns around fidelity. Both men and women um, were concerned about uh, cheating of the male partner or cheating of the female partner. There are also many concerns around side effects. Uh, it was mentioned in another presentation some, uh, th that was similar actually to Timor when there were side effects identified about condom use, about infections or uh, cancer or other sorts of side effects and also particularly around um, use of vasectomy about masculinity and the loss of masculinity. So there's quite a lot to pick apart uh, when thinking about how to promote and how to increase uptake to male family planning. I, I'm afraid I couldn't confidently speak about other areas in the Pacific. Uh, we do share findings a lot with Papua New Guinea as we have another Murray Stokes program working there that conducts vasectomy. Um, but absolutely, overall, it is, it is quite low, even though globally, uh, it is, our male family planning does make up for about 25% of contraceptive use. Thank you. Thank you. Karen, are, is IPPS doing something in this regard? Because I think uh, this is uh, a very big problem and in many countries also, even out of the Pacific region. So is IPPF working, has taken cognizance of this issue? Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I didn't hear the question. Uh, we want to know that is IPPF do, is looking into this matter of very poor male contraceptive usage in many countries. Uh, I have to admit that I feel that we're not as strong in male contraceptive use as we are certainly for female. In the Pacific, uh, IPPF is doing a study with uh, FN at the moment to look at non-scalpel vasectomy for men and the likely interest and uptake for non-scalpel vasectomy around the Pacific. So far, uh, the research has been done in Kiribati, and Fiji and Samoa, and then the plan is to do Tonga and Solomon Islands. Uh, we, was, we were hoping to do it this year, but not until next year. But it's an area of focus for us moving forward, um, that's for sure. Thank you. We have a question for Anna. Uh, uh, can you please quantify the STI prevalence? especially gonorrhea in the locations that you have worked? Or is there any data on that? Good everyone. Yeah, thank you for your question, Prasad. And um, it is quite difficult, as I think many people will be aware, to get um, accurate, timely, um, you know, statistics on contra um, sorry on STI prevalence. But just looking quickly at a study from two thousand and three, just as an example, um, with that was with uh, five hundred and forty seven pregnant women. Now, this was not in the the area same areas that we um, undertook the research in. Unfortunately, there isn't data that I could find for that. But um, this was taken in Port. Vila, 27% um, of those women test positive for trichomoniasis, 21.5 test positive for chlamydia, 5.6 for gonorrhea, and 2.4% for syphilis. But um, as might be understood, there's often underreporting due to lack of testing, but also um, due to the lack of ability to test as well. So this is just an example, but what we're hearing as well through conversations with health providers is they do see um, a lot of even um, syndromic symptoms, you know, coming through for STIs. Okay. Uh, thank you. There is a question for uh, uh, Kate. Uh, what are the traditional contraceptive methods they are using and how much safe are they? Yeah, thanks for that question. It's, it's a really good one. Um, so I, I, I'm, sh I'm not sure what it's like in, in other areas of the Pacific, but certainly when, um, when I have spoken to women and, and men about this in Vanuatu, often it will be quite... Um, kind of vague references to kind of leaf medicine or so um, you got leaf blam, um, there's a leaf for this particular um, thing. So or, or, so uh, there is a really interesting book called Anti-Fertility Plants of the Pacific. Um, and that does outline more specifically some of the, the um, 
the plants that have been used for um, as uh, um, for abortions um, and also for contraceptives. Um, so, I mean, I've heard <laughs> I've heard vague references to a particular red leaf that can be used. I've heard of people procuring abortions through the use of um, like lemon juice and strong coffee, um, as well as using like very vigorous massage. I know this is sort of abortion as opposed to um, as opposed to uh, uh, the prevention of conception. Um, so yeah, it, it's quite a tricky one to describe. And in terms of safety, I mean, again, um, I, I only really have anecdotal evidence at this stage of, of people um, uh, kind of arriving at hospital with um, kind of fairly um, unwell kind of vomiting or with incredible kind of abdominal pain. Um, so yeah, it's quite tricky to, to talk about the safety of, uh, and, and also to talk about the effectiveness of these um, methods. And certainly there was a mix of views in terms of, um, in terms of not quite sure if they're that effective, um, that modern methods are more effective to actually know these are what, these are really well established um, methods and, and therefore are, are, are more effective with being, and of course there are, um, social methods as well, such as um, abstinence during the postpartum period um, and those kinds of things that also need to be included, I think, in this kind of discussion. So that's a very long-winded way to say that we don't really have hard and fast data about this, but um, thank yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, there's a question for Michelle, uh, that females scored significantly worse than males and the Fijians of Indian origin may scored better than other those of other ethnicities. Did you explore more reasons for this? Thank you very much for the question. Um, so that, that was on particular areas of well-being. Um, I must say that I don't have an, uh, a theory for, for about the, the difference between ethnicities. I think um, maybe Ma might have, but um, you know, my understanding of both uh, for genes of Indian descent and from Itoke communities is that there is um, uh, both collective sort of society, um, societies and cultures uh, and are well supported. It, um, so it's, it's hard to, for me to comment on that. Um, I think the gender question um, is probably easier to answer and have some thoughts around particularly why females may score worse on certain areas and, they, and the, the one I think you're talking about specifically was around um, difficult emotions mm -hmm. and experiencing difficult emotions and I think women do tend to bear the brunt um, of blame. And, um, you know, if, if they have, say, for example, a child out of, of marriage, um, often it's a woman that's the one that's to blame and has to deal with the responsibility. Um, we did ask people or young people if they felt, if, if they had experienced sexual violence and rape, um, whether they would blame themselves. We did find that both men male and females said quite a high percentage of yes but it was for higher for females and i think that was around a third of females said that they would blame themselves um so but i think there is a sort of sense around um obviously the gender the gender differences and and women um uh, expected to be a bit of a particular way um which brings more shame and, and blame and fear of sort of isolation if, if they don't behave in a way that they're seen that they should be um, so, and then obviously all the other issues around gender inequality that play a much broader role in terms of, you know, education and employment and empowerment um, as well. So, yes, that, that's my answer in a nutshell. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. As we are running short of time, we will take up just one more question. And that question is for Olanike. Uh, Olanike, what is the role of government there in... Uh, responding to the unmet needs. All right, thank you so much for the question. Uh, as you all know, traditionally UNFPA works with the uh, Ministry of Health and with governments to uh, ensure access to sexual reproductive health services, including family planning. So in the Pacific, UNFPA has been responsible for about 90% of the product availability, but, but the government has continue to support the distribution of this 
contraceptives to the last mile. And um, they have also invested in some uh, healthcare worker capacity development and which we also continue to support them to do. But what we would like to see in the future is uh, more domestic resources uh, devoted to um, uh, procurement of supplies. We've also supported the government in uh, humanitarian interventions and the government itself has um, uh, committed resources in terms of human resources to ensure that uh, family planning services continue even in emergencies and even in the situation we have right now in the Pacific and globally around COVID, we have seen uh, the government prioritize uh, family planning services uh, as one of the services to be continued in the countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. And much as I would hate to, but I have to close the session now and we come to the end of the third session of APCR SHR 10 virtual. My sincere thanks to the chairperson, to the plenary speaker and to each of the abstract presenters for having a very, very lively and informative session today and also to the participants because without them, we would not have had such an intense discussion. We will now meet again on Monday, August 3 at 1 p.m. Cambodia time to take part in the fourth session of APCR SHR 10 virtual, which will be on the theme of young people and SRHR in Asia Pacific. And more details of this will be sent to you soon. Until then, mothe and bye and stay safe.